All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at this prayer. We're coming to the end of the letter, and we get one of those finallys. And I think we touched on this the last time we were together. I think we've outlined uh, the, the uh, next section together here in this book. So remember that Paul is, um, is working on these believers concerning um, standing fast and holding fast, keeping those traditions that were handed down to them. And in the, middle, in the midst of it all, we have a time of prayer requests, if you will. And he says, finally, brethren, uh, he's coming to his final point. And he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. All right, we're going to start right in on this. And I, I really wish that this had been given better translation. It's very weak here and very vague. Um, it, the word of God, free course, means to keep or running just as they are to keep on praying and being glorified. Uh, you have the word of God running and speeding ahead or running ahead. That's what it means. Um, if, when you read this, you're wondering what he means by free course. Um, because you would, you would compare that to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he says the word of God is not bound. Uh, so uh, really, it's, it's just, you need to change it really even in your Bible. Uh, it, it is, or run its race uh, without hindrance. Running in a track race is moving speedily in his lane. It's metaphorical. Paul uses, and the Greek language uses a lot of metaphor, metaphorical uh, meanings, and this is one of them. So think of this in these terms. Uh, pray that the word of God would run its, run its course, run its race, um, and, and, be, uh, and be crowned with glory, so to speak. Look in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 24 and 25, he says, Know ye not that they who run in a race run all. Now Paul is talking about his ministry here. Uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't get in the starting blocks and say, well, we'll see how it goes. You know, that's, that's, not what a, that's not what a runner does. He's done all this training. Uh, he's prepared himself. He comes to win the race. Uh, he, he's not there just to show up and have a nice time. Uh, and, uh, and that's what Paul is saying. Look at these Olympiads and... And to see how they run these races. But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Uh, you kind of get the idea there needs to be some effort here. There's some intensity behind these words, isn't there? And that every man that striveth for this mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You don't want to start make punching around and not hit anything. Uh, you do that, you open yourself up, and you're going to get knocked out. Okay? Um, when you're running, uh, you run cert not as uncertainly. Uh, you've got a definite idea of what you're... There's a definite strategy there. Okay? Um, so... Uh, that idea kind of carries through with this same request. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run its course, run in a certain fashion, unhindered, speeding forward. Uh, that's the idea here. Uh, uh, the word of the Lord has, uh, has course, that it, that it must run as God and as he is so willed to do so, regardless of men or enemies, because he talks about that. Look in verse 2. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. And who, know, who knew better than that than the Thessalonians? Remember how that church started. So Paul knew that the enemy would come, that men would try to hinder, uh, that there would be wicked... Um, 
uh, that there would be um, uh, wicked uh, motives. Um, look in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 4. Uh, that will help us along a little bit. Verse 14 rather. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights, holding forth the word of life. Uh, what do you have going on here? Well, on the inside, he's, he's telling them no, no murmurings, no disputings. Um, then in your own life, blameless, harmless children of God. Then you have a third uh, concern here. You're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Oh, then we should just wrap up and isolate and write our congressman. No, no, you're to shine as lights in the world. Notice how that's stated. He didn't say shine as lights in Philippi. Well, it would include that. But he's saying shine as lights in the world. And every believer has that responsibility. We're all under that missionary commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, and how do you do that? Well, the next verse tells you, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Holding forth the word. All right, it is so tempting to look throughout the book of Acts where it says the word of God grew and multiplied. And it always, we always find that statement right in the midst of trouble, seems like, uh, with the Grecian and the Palestinian widows. But the word of God grew. Um, where Paul and Barnabas were receiving persecution from the Judaizers, but the Greeks heard the word of God and the word of God grew. Um, so, um, and understand that the word of God has certain um, uh, personality. It's able to run. It's able to speed forth. It's, it's able not to be bound. It's quickening. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to make one wise into all sanctification of life. We've been studying the word of God in Psalms 119. And there's plenty of things that the word of God can do and will do. Um, and so understand that this book, this word of God, uh, is not your ordinary historical religious book. It is the spiration or breath of God. Um, and let's look in the book of Isaiah for a moment to give a little lesson about that. Uh, the book of Isaiah, the word of God is active. It's active. And we need to understand that. The word of God is living. It's quickening. Um, the word of God is like a hammer that breaks that adamant heart. Um, in the book of Isaiah chapter 55, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, verse 1, Isaiah 55, 1, Come to the waters, and he that hath no money, come, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. Eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This is, a, this is the psalm, or I mean, this is the writing of Isaiah of God's grace. Come, that's that gracious invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Come unto me, drink of the living waters. Come. Um, and let's look, if you will, um, here in these verses in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not there, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. We're going to study that on Tuesday night. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Do you see that? Uh, The word of God is active. It's able to do things. Um, for ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and, and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the, be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Uh, it will prosper whereunto I send it. Uh, I I don't think we can treat the Word of God uh, like another religious book or creed, uh, and I'm afraid we've done that. And the Word of God's been set aside in churches today. Um, Psalms 147.15 says this, He sendeth forth His commandment upon earth, His word runneth very swiftly. And that's a good translation for this idea that Paul is talking about. That the word of God um, would speed ahead and be honored. And uh, Psalms 147.15 hits the nail on the head. His word runneth very swiftly. Um, Glorify the word or honor it. Let's go back, if you will, please, and this emphasis on the Word of God. And can you see how that that really um, brings a very supportive aspect to the correction that Paul is making here in 2 Thessalonians? Right? Um, uh, For example, in 2, in, in, uh, let's look in 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 1, this isn't the first time we've seen this, in chapter 1, I'm sorry, in chapter 2, uh, verse 13, for this cause also thank we God, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually, what? Worketh also in you that believe. Um, If you notice in chapter 1 verse 6. But ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word. In much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. And from you sounded out the word of the Lord. There was a relationship with the word of the Lord. Uh, that was already, it's already been acknowledged in the first epistle and is reiterated here. So understand that there was this relationship with the Word of God in the, in the Thessalonians. Well, what happened? Well, <laughs> they weren't veteran Christians, you got to remember that. And they understood things academically. But when you put the, implement them, it's a whole other thing. It isn't that they had a less relationship with the word. They did not understand what it means to hold fast yet. Mm-hmm. And I think they learned that lesson here. Mm-hmm. Now Paul is bringing in the idea of speeding the word ahead. And that, that can be a prayer of us all. And be glorified even as it is with you. What does that mean? Honored. That the word of God should be honored. Um, Look in the book of Acts chapter 13, please. The book of Acts chapter 13. Uh, 
Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God. Uh, That's what we ought to be doing here, is hearing the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Um, You remember what Jesus told the the Judaizers uh, and the Jews of His day, that they they had no part with Him because they did not hear the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, You seek to kill me, these things did not Abraham, and that's a proof that the Word is not in you. You're not hearing the Word. Uh, And so notice, they came to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. Oh boy, here we go. Uh, That envy, you know, that all started way back with Joseph, didn't it? The brothers, uh, you remember how they told Joseph, hey, you dreamer, and people criticized Joseph. No, Joseph was acting as a prophet. Mm -hmm. He was given a prophecy, unfortunately, Kind of centered on him, but he can't help that. God's going to do what he's going to do. And even his father kind of got upset with him. Boy, what kind of disrespect is this, Joseph? You're telling me as your father, I'm going to bow down to you? And you remember his brethren, we'll never bow down to you. Uh, word of God came true, didn't it? Uh, they were bowing down to the second commander of Egypt, Pharaoh. And that happened to be Joseph. And but praise God for Joseph. He didn't get childish and uh, you know mentally irregular about it. He <laughs> uh, he saw God's program. He believed the gospel and the promises. Uh, he saw that what God did was move him ahead to uh, to preserve a posterity. See. He knew and understood the promises and the word of God. Too bad his brethren didn't, but he did. All right, they're here in envy. Uh, They envied Joseph. We know that it says in Matthew that uh, even Pilate knew that for envy they'd offered up Jesus. Envy. Uh, Here's this envy. And spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Uh, They had it in their head they were going to hinder this out of jealousy, out of envy. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But but seeing ye've put it from you. Now that's that's a harsher rebuke than what it looks like in Angler. He's saying you've divorced yourself from the word of God. You've put it away. You've put it from you. And judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Now if you look at the um, implication there, you can see that the word of God is that which brings everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a powerful word. It's the word of God that endureth forever. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, which abide, which liveth and abideth forever, Peter says in 1 Peter 1. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the nations, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Okay. As happened among you. All right. Now we've looked at that point. Let's move forward. That we might be delivered from wicked and evil men. Uh, That that seemed to be the, um, uh, that seemed always to be the agenda, didn't it? (laughs) Uh, The word of God comes in, then what happens? Persecution Persecution comes out. That's, uh, that's, uh, That's effective sowing. See, word of God comes in. And we know that men, when they receive the word of God or they hear the word of God, they will either receive it or they're going to reject it. There's no in-between. Or you're either receiving it or you're rejecting it. Um, And we know that persecution would soon follow. Uh, And Paul, knowing the agenda, says, and, (laughs) 
and that. If you follow that word that, you'll have the outline of these um, of these of this um, particular prayer. If you look in verse three, that the word of God would run ahead freely. In verse two, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Uh, so we we basically have two petitions here. Really, one's an intercession. Pray for us. That's intercession. Uh, Here is the petition uh, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Um, This idea means perverse or evil men. Paul is referring to uh, the opposing diabolic counteractive effort of the Judaizer. There's no question about that. He is also uh, he was also referring to the pagans, mm-hmm. paganism also, um, and that accounts for his, their activity, uh, as explained in the next statement. For true faith is not everyone's portion. <laughs> mm-hmm. True faith is not everyone's portion. That is that that's a, a a phrase that takes some discernment. Uh, in other words, that's being able to tell the men from the boys. Uh, those who are truly uh, uh, not claiming faith, but in the faith. Mm-hmm. See, um, there are many that claim faith, few that are in the faith, and they were. Uh, vicious and destructive against the truth of the gospel. And this hardened heartedness, this impenitent um, mend toward the gospel. Uh, Paul's own testimony bears this out. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. Uh, We have to appreciate this morning um, the the power of the word, uh, what it is able to do, uh, and that it be referenced, that it be glorified or magnified. Um, we have to understand, and I kind of like this mix because uh, sometimes you get the idea from some people, or they downplay it, um, you know, that the opposition, uh, it's all pie in the sky. When you go give the word, oh, blessings and only wonderful things will happen. Well, blessings and wonderful things will happen. But there's going to be some other things that's going to happen too. Wicked men don't like it. And our Lord preached it that way. <laughs> men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Don't you understand that? <laughs> um, the word of God condemns. It tells a man he's a sinner and needs a savior. Men don't want to be told that. Um, And so, and they want to continue on in the darkness. uh, That lifestyle that happens to be destroying them. And he says, for true faith is not everyone's portion. Uh, it, um, it, It cuts between the true and the false. The true and the false. There were claimers of faith, but they were false. Now, this is the kind of wicked men he's talking about. Uh, This is a a qualifier, a description. Uh, They were vicious and destructive against the truth of the gospel. And this hard-hearted, impenitent men toward the gospel, Paul's own testimony bears it out in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me and that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Boy, he really goes to town on himself here, doesn't he? But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love with his in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and worthy 
of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Uh, Who knew better about these wicked men than old Saul of Tarsus? Uh, And Paul knew exactly how to pray for that. So, uh, having been one of them, uh, in applying this terrible word to himself, Paul gives strong testimony to his belief in the deity of Christ. To blaspheme is to speak injuriously of God. And surely Saul of Tarsus, the strict Pharisee, could never have spoken thus of the Lord God of Israel, but he had spoken evil of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now he humbly confesses that blasphemy. Uh, That's what he means by that, and who would know better than Paul? Uh, He could characterize better than any. So um, so the history of this church uh, bears this out. If you look in the book of Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17 and you can see what had been what they had gone through. So when Paul is is expressing this, understand that the, the Thessalonican was familiar with it. He was familiar with it. I think it's important with prayer requests we be specific. Paul is specific here. Uh, you don't see Paul saying, well the Lord bless us and protect us and The Lord bless you and protect you too. See you later. Mm -hmm. No, he has specific prayer requests that the word of God would move speedily. See? And do its work. Uh, And now he has this specific request. Not all men have faith. Not true faith is not everyone's portion. Uh, We we might call it today, that's not everybody's giddy up. It's not everybody's theme. And we have a lot of that today as it's distinguished here. So we should be distinguishing it. We ought to have discernment uh, when someone's claiming faith or claiming things uh, about the faith. We ought to have discernment. Um, I've had a wonderful time with some folks in the back of my truck. I've had some Christians. I remember one man <laughs> I was taking from the, it was a late night run from the airport. And we got to talking. And when anybody asked me, what do you do? Okay, they asked. Now, I provoke it by asking what they do. And anybody that has manners in conversation returns the favor. See, this I know. And so I'm able to tell them, well, wouldn't you know? And, uh, and I, I remember what the man says, you know what? I'm not in here by accident, am I? I said, no, you're trapped by a sovereign God and you're going to get it. <laughs> He says, I haven't been living right. I said, I kind of thought so the way you was talking. You know, and you telling me that you're at the bar drinking and now you're in the back of my truck claiming to be a Christian. I, I'm sorry, how's that go together? I'm just curious. Just, I'm just curious. Well, I haven't been living the way I should. I, I need to get back. I said, well, I don't know how you mean that, but you need to repent. You need to come back with God. That was one that got a daily bread in a track. Mm-hmm. And, uh, when we, and, and again, I took the long way around the city with that one. And uh, he kind of noticed that. <laughs> says, you didn't take the short route, did you? I said, no, I took, I took our time. We needed time. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, that was a ministry there. Not all that claim have that portion of true faith. And we need to recognize, we need to have that discernment. Um, and Paul is helping us with that. It also kind of tells us that he, he, when you give that kind of a, a statement, you're relying on the, the, the receiver to understand it. So I, I do believe that these, these Thessalonians had enough sense to understand what he's saying. You don't ask prayer requests to a group of people and they don't understand what you're talking about. You're not going to submit that. Um, and I, I think that the Thessalonians knew that. All right, look in chapter 17, verse 1. And it says, Now when they had passed through 
uh, Amphipolis. That's one of those words I like to say. It's kind of a neat. Uh, and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Paul was tenacious to get after those Israelites. But remember, we've done a study on this in Acts, haven't we? Um, there was Gentiles there uh, that were coming to hear. Um, there were proselytes. Uh, there were Palestinian Jews. Uh, and there was the Greek Jew and, and that was coming to those Sabbaths. And the word of God was being read, the Old Testament. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. That won't echo in a synagogue well. Okay? That Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. So Paul didn't preach a message that people wanted to hear. He preached the gospel. He preached the word. I notice, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Hey, well, we're, we're kind of reaching the, the hot shots, if you will, even with the gospel here. But, uh-oh, uh-oh, here they come. Uh, and know, know this, that there, there may not be those who need, should be faithful to the word, but though the opposers will always be faithful against the word. That, that's bound to happen. But the Jews who believe not moved with envy. Now, that idea, the Jews who what? Believe not. Oh, they claimed God and they claimed the word of the Old Testament. But they didn't have that portion of true faith. Our Lord dealt with them openly many times about it. If ye would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Oh, they didn't like that. Oh, they didn't like that. Um, and and uh, remember, if Abraham were your father, he would not kill me. You would hear my words. See? Uh, they did not believe. There was not that portion of true faith. And notice... Moved with, well, they are consistent. Moved with envy, took unto them certain vile fellows of the baser sort. I like that statement. The boys in the gutter. All right? And gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down, are come here also. What a wonderful testimony. Uh, that's right up there with what they said to John and Peter. Why, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Thank you very much. That's what we're supposed to do. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they had heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea by night, under cover of darkness, uh, who coming there went into the synagogue of the Jews. <laughs> right back to the... <laughs> Paul was tenacious. <laughs> um, but now you notice, uh, then they would understand this prayer request. They'd all went through it together, hadn't they? For true faith is not everybody's portion. Okay, uh, they uh, and so thus uh, we we wouldn't be uh, we we would understand that and they would understand it. And what's Paul ask, asking for? To be rescued. It, it's almost a foregone conclusion he's going to be somehow <laughs> confined. <laughs> it just seemed like that always happened. Uh, but notice, if you will, and, and we can't get into it all the way, but that's the word to choose here. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse uh, uh, and verse two, that that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. And that word delivered means rescued, rescued, and really it it's rescued from the unreasonableness of evil men. 
Uh, that's the idea. Um, man's uh, counselor outrageous conduct. <laughs> uh, men's counsel and outrageous conduct. That's what this translates out to. Uh, let's look in the book of Romans chapter 15, if you will, please. The book of Romans chapter 15, verses 30 through 33. Romans fifteen thirty. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted by the saints." that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Now the peace, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Um, that we would be delivered or rescued. Um, out of place, it's, a, it's a on, a odd, unbecoming, perverse, outrageous. Now, things can get that way when light shines on darkness, by the way. They can get nasty, okay? <laughs> so let's go back, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that we may be rescued from the outrageous behavior uh, and the unbecoming of unbecoming, pre, uh, of the unbecoming and perverse men. For not all have the faith. All right, so the next time we're together, we'll have to, I can't start thought, I know what will happen. We're going to have to start right there with what that means, okay? The next time we are together. I uh, can't stress enough the importance of prayer and that this also can be used as a model or pattern concerning prayer. Okay, let's end with the word of prayer, please. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, teach us to pray. And Father, may we pray for our missionaries. May we pray for one another. Uh, and Father, may we pray that the word of God would speedily move ahead in all of its effectiveness. And Father, we pray that we would indeed be rescued from uh, unre the unreasonableness of perverse and wicked men. And these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.